you know, people don't want to spend currencies that they think are going to go up in value. There's like a fundamental uh, kind of conflict there. Like no one wants to spend their Bitcoin. So like if people truly believe that this is worth something, they're not going to spend it. And if they're going to spend it, then they, they don't think it's worth anything or they think it's going to be stable, like a stable coin. So we, we kind of very much believe in this like two currency model of either a virtual currency or a stable coin for your kind of purchases. And then this kind of loyalty, you know, slash capital that you accumulate for doing your actions that does have the potential to grow in value. Layer One is a podcast and community dedicated to helping you master all things crypto. We'll be bringing you the best interviews with project executives, technical analysis for trading of the most popular cryptocurrencies, and insight into what's actually happening behind the scenes. As you join us each episode, you're going to hear about tokens, fundraisers, investments, and even crypto conspiracies. But please remember that nothing we say should be considered financial or legal advice. Come join us on this journey and welcome to Layer One. Alrighty, everybody, we are back with a, another episode of the Layer One podcast. It's another Tuesday, which means we've got an awesome guest and are recording uh, another one of these awesome podcasts for you guys. Really appreciate everybody tuning in, uh, whether it's Layer One Live or uh, these interviews that we're doing. Uh, before we get to our guest today, I have to kick it over to my main man, Q. How you doing, buddy? I'm doing good, man. It's a, it's a good day here. Uh, we're happy to have Peter Watts, CTO from Props. I know we told you guys about uh, props in, in the episode we were having on Layer 1 Live that we do on Monday, so we do have this episode to get to. Uh, I do want to kick it over to Peter real quick. Peter, how are you doing? I know it's early or late, however you want to say it. It's 3 a.m. Uh, where you are, but how are you? I'm doing pretty good, yeah. Based in Sydney these days, so doing some, some weird hours, uh, you know, working with my New York colleagues, but otherwise, everything's all good. Awesome, man. Well, we appreciate you kind of being on our time here. That's a that's a really uh, a good thing there. So uh, we do kind of want to get into your background. That's kind of the first thing we get into. Uh, I want to get into how you found yourself in America and then back to Australia, but also kind of your work experience. We talked a little bit about that before uh, the episode started. So let's go into kind of your background uh, before you found yourself at you now and in, in props. Sure. So my background is kind of mostly in music, which came out of playing in bands and then taught myself to code and then started building related websites to help bands get uh, posters printed. And that kind of went into kind of tools for venues and other music discovery stuff. And then started a company called Swarm FM, which brought me to America, raised some money trying to make that happen. It was built on top of Spotify. So the early days of Spotify just coming to the US uh, and potentially emerging as a platform. Turned out it didn't really work out in terms of uh, other apps building on top of Spotify. So uh, things didn't quite work out there, but it was, it was kind of good fun. And from there, I got connected uh, through USV actually to YouNow, which is a live streaming app. And so started kind of working on that and originally it was just going to be, you know, a little one month contract, but have, was there for five years in the end. Just a really interesting space live streaming in the early days of it. This was pre Meerkat and Periscope. And so all of these, those things kind of landed. Facebook came in, YouTube came in. Um, and, you know, I was kind of really early there. And, and I guess a little different from some of these others, also really early on this idea of paying creators and kind of having partners similar to, YouTube and these two-sided kind of economies where, again, something you see very often where you have people buying gifts in order to give the streamer and that kind of coming up, you know, I was like very early in the US to do that. Um, and then kind of while we're at you now, just trying to figure out how, you know, especially with all this new competition that came in, how do we differentiate um, and how do we kind of stand out? Like, what can we do that Facebook's not going to do? And that kind of brought us to this idea of, can we give, you know, and at the same time, we had these creators that were asking us, you know, can I have stuck in the company? You know, I, I'm helping to make this thing such, such a success. And, you know, we're trying to compete for and retain this talent. And, um, you know, they're kind of mercenaries. If another platform is going to pay them more, then they'll leave. So it's like, what can you do to kind of make them aligned to make this, particular you know your service successful and so that kind of led us to the kind of the the props 
idea around how, you know, in, in the same way that something like equity helps to retain employees and really motivate them to make this company a success because they can potentially share in some financial upside, can we do something similar for users of kind of social media products? And so that was kind of a need that we felt at you now and started building props and then did it as a, a platform that other apps can use as well. Yeah, so I'm super interested uh, in this conversation because I've really been getting into these models of like play to earn that have kind of weaved themselves into gaming and content and social media like you're talking about, as well as kind of how blockchain breaks open these like closed economies that that have traditionally just like gone to favor maybe just even the platform itself, not not any type of creator, not any type of user that's like ingesting the content. So it kind of break down props in, in what the platform you know, was designed to do or what, what the tokens designed to do and how that benefits users and kind of streamers alike. Yeah. So, so, uh, you know, has had like a virtual currency for many years before props and it was one of those, those closed loop, uh, things. And so, and, and so props actually is like a different beast. It's, it's not actually designed to be spent. And most of the apps that we work with continue to have a regular virtual currency. I mean, there's a lot of interesting stuff in crypto, especially stable coins that may become like a good way for transactions, but actually, you know, in-app purchases and virtual currencies, they work pretty good for value transfer within a, a single app, you know, and arguably better than crypto today. So all the, you know, some of these other platforms like, you know, telegrams ton and the, these sorts of things that are designed to be used, like it's, it's kind of questionable of like, is that actually um, an improvement over just an in-app currency? And, and so props is very specifically um, designed to be held. So you hold the token in order to unlock benefits. So then, and the more you hold, the kind of higher tier up uh, you're in. So it's, it's closer to, to loyalty points. And it's, it's specifically designed also to kind of uh, give those that hold it, you know, that potential financial upside where the, you know, constrained supply, if, if you can have more and more people holding it while you're also growing demand, then uh, trying to kind of get the token economics to work in your favor there. Again, you know, if you, if you can contrast that to uh, a currency that's supposed to be spent, well, you know, people don't want to spend currencies that they think are going to go up in value. There's like a fundamental uh, kind of conflict there. Like no one wants to spend their Bitcoin. So like if people truly believe that this is worth something, they're not going to spend it. And if they're going to spend it, then they, they don't think it's worth anything or they think it's going to be stable, like a stable coin. So we, we kind of very much believe in this like two currency model of either a virtual currency or a stable coin for your kind of purchases. And then this kind of, loyalty you know slash capital that you accumulate for doing your actions that does have the potential to grow in value and ideally you want it to grow in value you know in a way that is kind of aligned with the user's actions so the idea that if if, if they are helping to make the platform successful they're kind of bringing new users into the platform they're kind of adding value to the business then that can feed through through to um, you know the fact that they're earning this token, and and it's helping to accumulate value in that token. Gotcha. Yeah, that, that makes sense. I, I think the 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 metaphor uh, to the rewards token or kind of the loyalty points is a is an appropriate one. So, as users uh, are are going through this structure that that Props has built, are they able to cash in that token? Um, is that kind of in the future plans or? Um, you know, what, what does essentially the reward structure look like there? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it's a, it's an ESC 20 token. It's transferable. We're taking things pretty kind of slow on the liquidity and making sure we do everything right there. We also took the path to get it in the U S regulated as a, as a reggae, uh, token. So trying to do everything above board because ultimately this is very much targeted at kind of mainstream users. Maybe we'll, we'll kind of get into this, but the apps that we work with, they're 99.99% non-crypto users. And the idea is that props will be the first crypto that people earn. And so we don't want it to be something where the only kind of liquidity you can get is some kind of 
random tiny little exchange or you have to do something complicated like use uniswap that you know may have a high barrier to entry you know we want to be on the kind of top tier uh kind of places where you can easily kind of buy it or, or sell it um as you need and we just want to make sure we do that kind of all above board so we're taking the kind of uh, slower making sure we do everything right there and so that will come uh you know very soon hopefully and 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 for now just focusing on getting it integrated in a few apps and allowing people to start earning earning it but yeah so all of that will come yeah i know uh when we were looking into props there's a handful of apps that uh you know can be can uh utilize the props token now that you guys have have essentially partnered with so um what are what are some of those uh apps that are available now and kind of what what type of app do you target? I know you said you, you guys are focusing on the mainstream user base, but um, you know, it, it, are you looking at social media apps? Are you looking at kind of gaming applications? What's the what, what's the uh, structure that Props looks for? Yeah, I think it can be all sorts of apps. So this is again something uh, like a, a core principle, which is trying to keep the the protocol as simple as possible. And, and this is maybe a bit of a tangent, but but basically it's the apps themselves that integrate with the protocol and effectively like mine tokens from the protocol. And then they pass on rewards to their end users and they have full flexibility of how they do it. So, you know, in the early days we looked at, should, should that be like built into the protocol? You think of maybe something like Steam where there's like posts and there's likes and it's kind of at the protocol level and there's a couple of problems where it's like easily uh, kind of manipulatable and it kind of constrains which apps can work here. So for us, it's like very kind of uh, high level and kind of open at the protocol level. And then all sorts of different apps that, uh, you know, have any sort of, uh, you know, need to kind of reward and incentivize their users, all sorts of apps can uh, join. And so it's typically, Kind of these content apps where you have these power users that are creating high value content um and, and 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 very often have not just like high value content creators but high value maybe players or you know whales so to speak which you often see in these sort of streaming uh applications it, it can also be kind of peer-to-peer -peer marketplaces you know this app listia we have launching soon is a example of this where you have sellers you have buyers you're trying to incentivize kind of certain behaviors i think gaming is a good one especially because a lot of the users there understand these virtual currencies so they're a little bit more kind of uh, clued in uh, you know any anywhere where there's these sorts of behaviors that you are trying to incentivize and you're really using it uh, as a way to basically enhance existing kpis so an app will come along that wants to increase the retention of its users, wants to increase, increase the like regular kind of dollar revenue that it's getting out of their users. It can use props as like a, as an add-on to kind of try and supercharge that and, and incentivize just like regular behaviors uh, rather than necessarily kind of like totally changing their business to be like a crypto uh, first thing. It's like this thing that you can kind of really easily drop into a number of different ads. So I think add ons a good word there because I was, you know, when you were talking there, I was thinking like Twitch streams and how they use bits and, and different types of like in, in platform currencies. Is this something that like from a personal level, maybe a Twitch streamer could uh, like add onto their stream on top of this bit system? Or does it, some, is it something that has to live kind of within the platform and therefore like not usable on Twitch? What's the incentive for a platform to do this and not have their own currency? What, what makes them go outside of it and say, I want to bring in props? Yeah, I mean, it's something we've talked a lot about of could we, you know, get some of these really large platforms and, and have individual creators using it. I think maybe one of the best ways to get there is actually, you know, a lot of these creators will use a, an addition, like a separate platform for their kind of super fan management. So whether it's like Patreon or, or some of these other platforms and I think having props integrated there so that allows the creator to kind of work with their fans and maybe use... Uh, props to incentivize their fans. I think that's maybe one of the directions we'll go rather than maybe kind of like, well, more or less, like any creator is going to use some platform probably to manage their, their super fans in their relationships. So I think that's where you'll see props integrated and in, uh, allowing creators to use it on top of places like 
Twitch. And and then I guess the question of like, um, you know, why would an app adopt this rather than create their own? I mean, it, it's really hard uh, to create your own, um, not just all the kind of regulation and getting liquidity and just building out a whole lot of the, the tech stack. I mean, it's certainly possible. And I, th I think you'll, you'll see different things, maybe like the really large companies like a Reddit, right? It, it probably does make sense for them to do their own. They're big enough um, and they want to you know, make that work. But for a lot of the smaller companies, you know, if you look at kind of what you now went through, where it's just like a multi-year, you know, huge shift for the company to, to go for this. Most companies like don't have that appetite, especially kind of once the, the kind of crypto bubble has cooled down a little, people have realized that, you know, just spinning up an ICO and getting some free money like isn't actually reality. Um, and so that's why, again, going back to this idea of like an add-on where it's like, if you're, if you're a company, um, you'll, you know, you don't necessarily want to shift your entire direction, but you want to kind of take advantage of this, this thing that's been created. And, and so we very much position it as close to as possible as, you know, like a regular SaaS service and, and build a lot of middleware so that it feels like you're just interacting with web 2.0, uh, APIs so that, it, you know, it, for 99% of kind of these apps and, and social media businesses that are in, you know, this smaller range, just, it's like a no brainer to use this rather than do it yourself. And the, the other thing I'll say is we're kind of taking what we call like an upmarket approach where we're, we're kind of going to increasingly larger uh, apps to kind of adopt it. And so some of the, the really large apps, they may look at it and be like, well, you know, it's a lot smaller than we are. Um, but as we kind of grow, you know, the, the initial apps are kind of in the, the millions of, of users now and, and kind of grow that to 10 million. And, and, and eventually, you know, maybe some of these larger companies, it may also make sense, but uh, there's enough businesses to uh, you know for us there's a there's a kind of long list of businesses where, where it does make sense and i think there'll always be the one percent that you know that get it that kind of want to throw a ton of resources and do it themselves but the 99 percent, i think it makes more sense to adopt something like this yeah that makes sense and you you touched really on what my next question is uh, around users right so if, i think the thought uh, as i understand it is that if you can pool together a lot of users across some of the smaller to medium sized uh, applications that are out there who don't have the the time or the resources to commit to a project like this you could then kind of you know coagulate quite a large user base and, and go and attempt to talk to like your twitches and your reddits and, and some of these other folks so um you know at, at, as of today right where does that kind of total user number stand that uh, are interacting with with props in, in the ecosystem uh, let me let me open up the dashboard. I think it's around three million, and this is uh, kind of users that have owned props in, in just a few apps. So actually, just two apps uh, are officially live currently, um, and then we have a couple more launching soon. And then you know there's a bit of a pipeline in various stages. It, it's interesting to to point out that you know we're taking this approach of a little more a little more premium. Uh, large apps so not, not necessarily going for like a long tail of tiny apps with 100 users or no users it's really sure. more established kind of businesses with like large existing user bases and so it's almost like a, a premium umbrella like a, a little bit like a like an airline you know one world these sorts of things where they've got a few and you almost want to like cover different verticals and kind of get this large base of users that are, you know, not necessarily competing, but they're like slightly overlapping in different areas in order to get really wide coverage. That's kind of the approach we're taking. Got it. And uh, as we were looking through props uh, on the, on your blog post, you talk about how you guys have successfully uh, brought on, you know, one of the most famous venture firms out, you know, pretty much ever in Union Square Ventures. And I know you, you said you have a background with them there. Uh, you, you were successfully able to go out and do a, about a $2 million raise that they, they led, which is, is very impressive. Congratulations on that front. Uh, what will that raise and in, in that firm as a partner allow props to do in the future? Do you guys have uh, other plans alongside the token or other plans to kind of 
expand the role of, of the token and the role of props within these apps? Yeah, so the last couple of years have been um, like a lot of just iterating on kind of the protocol and the design and the, and the, the go to market and figuring out how to uh, kind of structure this to apps, how to make it super simple for them, building a lot of the middleware um, that they can just drop into their apps. And so this recent raise was really just about kind of having some runway to now like go out and kind of sell that to kind of more apps and get the adoption. And we're really looking to get, you know, to something in the order of kind of 20 to 30 million users um, on this runway over the next kind of 12 to 18 months. You know, I think right now uh, it, it's not the best time to, to be raising money. So it was great to be able to get that closed. And we really kept it to as minimum as possible uh, because, you know, I think we'll be in a very different place in, uh, you know, 12 to 18 months. And, and so, yeah, it's really about kind of getting to that, that next level and, and being able to get some of these pieces in place like the liquidity. Uh, and then, uh, you know, we'll see where the crypto market is in, in 18 months. I think that uh, the macro crypto market has a big impact on a lot of this stuff. And so while it's, you know, a little quiet, uh, you know, we, we wanted to just kind of have enough to, to get going and, and really uh, ramp it up. And, and once we can get to that kind of, 20 million uh, target, then I think these sorts of apps that we can bring on are kind of like the next tier. And, and then maybe we start to make it a little bit more self-service rather than us kind of talking to every app. So these are some of the things we have in mind. Yeah, I do want to get to talking about the markets back in, in 2017, 2018, because you guys have been around uh, for, for that around amount of time, uh, at least from like the prop standpoint. But uh, we did talk about users and, and you kind of uh, said something to like the effect of 99% of the users that you, you want or that you're targeting are, are non-crypto. So I wonder how much of maybe your marketing or how much of your time is spent on actually educating not only the people that are that are going to get these tokens, but the actual apps that are going to be implementing the token itself. Cause you kind of have to educate the app almost to educate its user about what the hell it's, this user is going to get. Cause they're going to get this token and be like, what, like what's happening here. Right. Like uh, there's a ton of users that are just not technical enough to uh, get that. I don't mean to be shitting on anybody out there. Uh, but how do you go about educating the, the people that you're trying to target 99% uh, about crypto when they're receiving essentially a crypto token? Yeah, I mean, I'd say it's like part education, part abstraction, so that they don't necessarily have to know. And so we do, we do like a few clever things where we have this two chains where we have a side chain and then we have a core token on Ethereum. And so the users, when they initially earn props, it gets recorded on the side chain and they don't, they don't need to have set up a wallet yet in order to start accumulating things. And so that allows them to just be using the app for them to feel like it's kind of regular loyalty points. And then after they get enough, it can be like this slow education of like, what is this thing? You know, they can go into, uh, you know, some of the education, learn a bit more. We can hold their hand because it's not like blocking their experience of using uh, the app. It's kind of like an advanced thing that they can go to, uh, after the fact, they're not like, as soon as they install the app, it's like, you know, back up the seed phrase. Um, <laughs> so exit that, app. <laughs> exactly. So it, it, there's a lot of abstraction there. So yeah, it's basically like hide it in the background and then kind of slowly, and, and it's a lot of, it's, it's also a bit of a focus on the power users. Um, and they're the kind of most important ones to, to walk through it. And, and yeah, it's true with the apps. There's a little bit of education there. And again, it's the same thing of like giving them tools that is um, as much as possible, just out of the box, familiar to them. They don't they don't want to become blockchain engineers or have to hire a blockchain engineer. They just want it to be um, as simple as possible. And so that's definitely the approach. And I think it's uh, kind of the future where it's like I think the majority of people kind of will earn their first crypto rather than buy their first crypto. And that will kind of be there. It's also just, you know, like a, a lot more kind of, you know, given all the hoops that come with crypto on ramps, 
it's just a kind of much simpler and easier way. And, and that's, I guess, another piece of our strategy where right now we're kind of just focusing, you know, as, as more of like a little behind the scenes tool for apps um, and not really kind of marketing props too much amongst the crypto community. We're really focused on, you know, going to those apps and, and having a solution that works for them. But once we establish a few apps where this is available, then, you know, we can start to position props as, yeah, if you want to own crypto, you know, this is kind of the easiest way to do it. Here's like a selection of apps where you can go and use your time to earn crypto rather than your money. And I, and I think kind of we'll be able to do that once we're a little bit more established. Yeah, that quote that you just had where most people are going to earn their first crypto and not pay for it. That's an awesome quote, man. I think I'm going to use that uh, once or twice here over the coming months. But uh, I like that idea as well of kind of gamifying uh, the person as they go through the process, right? Like, oh, you reached goal one here, have access to this. And, and gamifying that process makes it a little bit more accessible maybe to non-technical users. Uh, so I did want I, I did say this. I want to touch on uh, kind of 2017, 2018, you know, doing research before the episode. Uh, I went into a couple of YouTube videos and, and you guys are sitting there 2017, maybe like February, 2018. And you're talking to, you know, guys who are maybe not even in crypto anymore. And uh, just, I wonder what your, what your mindset and, and the, the process that you guys have gone through with uh, attempting to do the ICO. And, and I'd love for you to go through that. Cause I remember uh, being at ICO, I remember working with you guys a little bit, but uh, I wonder how the landscape has changed for you guys being in it uh, and, and just kind of take me through the process and the mindset and the changes that have gone through your uh, company and, and all these things since 2017 to now. Yeah, I mean, it was definitely a, a different, crazier time. Um, you know, we, we kind of came at it um, in the sense of, you know, having a specific problem that we were trying to solve in terms of um, kind of how can we uh, give users something that incentivizes them, that provides the right uh, kind of ticks the right boxes in terms of like engineering something that can give them the financial upside, but is, is highly flexible, more flexible than trying to give them stock or something like this and kind of arrived at this solution. And it was, it was, good timing in the sense of there was a lot of that uh, attention there. I mean, we worked with CoinList, which was very nice to kind of have something a bit more, um, uh, you know, official and rather than the kind of wild, wild uh, West there. And yeah, I mean, there was a bunch of those kind of questionable YouTube accounts uh, that uh, were up back in the day. But it was good, you know, for us, we, you know, kind of, uh, you know, raised some money and then kind of got to work and really have had our, our heads down, uh, you know, obviously paying attention to everything that's, uh, that's going on, but really um, focusing on, on building there. And it's definitely a, a different time now. Like, I don't, I don't know if, like, are people still doing ICOs? Um, mm. I don't actually know. Oh, <laughs> It's gotten crazy, man. But uh, I don't know. Have you followed uh, ICOs at all? Well, I, I, not particularly. I mean, it's, it sounds like you know they're, they're still trying to do it, but you know they have to get a little bit, a little bit more creative. Maybe you tell me. Well, now people are doing a personal token offering, so they're actually ICOing themselves. So we've gone one step for step further into kind of that meta uh, kind of uh, <laughs> mindset. Yeah, it's a uh, yeah, and like. The DAOs are coming back. Um, mm -hmm. it, it's definitely uh, it's interesting times, and, and and like the regulation is like still a bit unknown. But but I think what's what's kind of nice to see is that even though there's maybe not full guidance, people are kind of uh, you know finding these new approaches. And I think what Compound is doing, where it's like you know you launch a platform, there is no token. Um, you establish value for it, then you kind of bring it in as like a governance mechanism. And I'm sure eventually that, you know, it'll, it'll start to trade and, and, and have a value. And, the, you know, there's, I think there was uh, some casualties along the way to learn it, learning the best practices. You know, some of these companies that were getting sued by the SEC, we were actually like, we were actually really lucky that we were a little bit later than some of, you know, the real, early kind of ICO ones that did some 
irresponsible things in terms of selling to the public. So we already could learn from some of those benefits and, you know, be a bit more uh, kind of responsible and, and sensible there. I mean, it sounds like that's evolved even further to, you know, some best practices emerging because, you know, obviously you, you know, don't want to be stuck in, you know, with all of these restrictions, but, you know, you want these people to be able to create new ideas and, and, and raise money for them, but, you know, not have to necessarily, for, there should be the, the decentralized equivalent to, you know, starting a company and raising money for it. I think what, what existed in 2017, like, wasn't the ideal. And we're like gradually getting there to something that makes sense. It kind of keeps, uh, you know, retail investors safe and maybe gives them some access to some of these opportunities, which I think is important. And that's like another thing where I think the SEC is realizing and slowly getting there that kind of all of these, um, you know, restrictions for investors to participate, like don't, you know, it should be more of like a skill test rather than a, an income test potentially, or, or even, you know, just proving that you could lose it all as long as you can prove that, you know, that you can do that. You don't necessarily need a million dollars. Uh, so I think, I think it's definitely pushed things forward and we're slowly getting to uh, a better place but then yeah it's cool to see some of this uh, crazier fringe stuff uh, with the personal tokens and, and some of the other stuff yeah it's it's you know kind of rinse and repeat to one degree but but hopefully there's some balance there as well to to you know appease the regulators a little bit and uh as you said you know if it's on the accredited investor standpoint hopefully that that changes sooner rather than later and and you know uh kind of both parties can can mesh with the the various goals that each one has uh, now, obviously, you're the, the CTO for Props, right? So on the technical side, you had mentioned that you guys are using Ethereum as kind of like a main chain, but then you're also working with a side chain concept as well. So can you kind of break that down and also talk a little bit about how Algorand works in all of that? Sure. So we went with Ethereum, you know, it's the king, right? And then there's a bunch of network effects there in terms of, interacting with you know with wallets with exchanges that have in, you know done it all of this DeFi system that's emerging there's just a, you know, a bunch of network effects that kind of make it set how it makes sense in addition to security right it's kind of uh there's a lot of value that's being secure there it's a good place for kind of high value uh transactions but not so much for high volume low value transactions so we kind of had this split design where we could use a second chain you know a layer two for our you know to record the, the mass transactions that are happening throughout the day um and it fits with our ux thing that i mentioned earlier where a user can earn immediately without having to set up a wallet yet so it's kind of serving two purposes it's, it's a scaling mechanism in addition to a kind of ux hack where they can kind of earn it on this this second chain this layer two there's a bit of trust with the app um, but then if they want to get trustless, then they claim their props, they kind of set up a wallet and, and then they are in, a, in the trustless world. And so we originally built that with kind of a private uh, using Hyperledger Sawtooth and it's, it kind of did the trick for a while, but it's just, uh, you know, unwanted overhead to be maintaining uh, your own kind of infrastructure there if you don't have to. And so that's kind of where Algorand comes in, where we're essentially planning to move that layer two activity over to Algorand. And so there's a few advantages there. For one, it's just, you know, it's a, a functional chain that we don't have to kind of worry about keeping it up and resetting it in the middle of the night and coordinating with all the validators. Um, and it's, it's public and transparent. So rather than us building custom metric sites that people kind of just, you know, trust that we're kind of telling the truth, you can go to uh, Algorand Block Explorer and see that, you know, this is all happening there. And so we're planning to do that kind of around the end of Q3, but the Ethereum token will still live on Ethereum for now. And, and the way it's always worked is that there is essentially oracles or validators that we call them that are kind of looking at all of the activity that happens on the layer two. And then once a day, basically compressing that and summarizing it to 
the Ethereum where the protocol lives. And so they're basically saying the, this is the activity that all of the apps had across the course of a day. And then the protocol uses that to mint rewards to the apps. So it's the protocol is kind of agnostic to what technology is used on the layer two, as long as uh, kind of the apps and the validators are able to coordinate amongst each other, find some way to, to put it and be able to kind of bring that data back to Ethereum. So. Got it. Thanks. That that was great. And when it comes to those validators, um, you know, just as context in general, right, obviously uh, proof of stake and the concept of, of validation or staking as a service or just kind of, you know, a, a regular user acting as as this validator, um, as this, this, you know, thematic has continued to grow, how do you guys see uh, your validator base growing? And, and the reason I ask that is because I think a lot of uh, protocols, ETH is obviously moving to proof of stake, Algorand, right? There are so many that are trying to attract users with these validators. Um, is there a larger plan for the validator set or, um, you know, are those validators more kind of just held in-house with props uh, for, for maybe efficiency reasons? Yeah, I mean, we're definitely planning to open it up and have more validators and have them kind of collected. Although I will say that for props, the validators are kind of a smaller role. Like the, the, the main miners are really the apps and we want as much of the kind of inflationary rewards to go to the apps because that eventually flows through to the users. And so that's again, like another reason to, you know, be utilizing Ethereum, to be utilizing Algorand. We want to be, you know, we want to pay kind of the opposite like pitch in terms of people that are running validators we, we kind of want to pay the validators as little as possible um, and so we want to minimize that role as little as possible we want to pay them enough for it to be secure but we don't want them to be having to run beefy aws instances mm -hmm. and they'd be high cost because we want the you know as little of the rewards to have to go to them to kind of cover you know to properly incentivize them but then as much as possible can go to the apps who are kind of you know really like if you look at all these platforms like if it's a traditional like layer one then the validators are kind of like the operators um you know they're they're running the ledger whatever it may be and so for us the apps really are that that core role they're performing the main work on the system and so they should get the the bulk of the rewards yeah i want to get to my next question but before that just from like a cto's perspective what other networks uh were you guys considering were you guys considering any other networks at all and then then like what other smart contract platforms other than maybe ethereum uh do you uh kind of see and like what they're doing essentially i don't i don't know that might be too general but i'll throw it your way yeah i mean there's a lot these days um <laughs> too much and yeah I, I mean we were looking at just a private you know private ethereum that didn't necessarily solve our needs of like not running the infrastructure but it was at least at least kind of consistent you know technology between the two there's a there's a few that are like just you know that we were talking to but they they weren't quite launched so like near i near protocol i believe launched yesterday or something like that and there's mm -hmm. solana and there's a a few of them that are, are just coming compared to Algorand that's always been out for a while. Um, and I think that uh, kind of probably the most interesting in the future will be like the Polkadot model. I know Cosmos is kind of launched, but I, I, I'm a, a bit more of a fan of uh, the parody team, or at least have like, they seem to be kind of very thoughtful and experienced um and are going about it you know in a very good way so this idea of kind of individual chains per application kind of makes a lot of sense and and, and the polka dot path seems to be a little simpler where there's kind of shared security so rather than cosmos where you kind of need your own validators and you know i, I believe they're looking into shared security as well but some of these things you know the whole point of trying to leverage one of these networks, like one of the reasons we leverage Ethereum is it's just uh, because there's so much value at stake, it's, it's highly secure. And so, you, you don't, you know, if, if every network is bringing its own security, then like the cost to attack it comes way down. So I, I think from what I understand of the Polkadot path, that makes a whole lot of sense. I mean, 
there's also ETH2, you know, one day will come. Uh, but yeah, I, I think our needs were a lot less for this side chain is really just high throughput and, and basic recording. And that's something that Algorand's really, really good at. You know, it's, it's, it's pretty cool. I don't know how much you've played around with it, but you know, you go to Coinbase, for example, and you, you know, with, you withdraw some algos to your wallet and it just, it, they're there. There's none of this like 15 block, uh, you know, wait for the confirmation. It's like, oh, it's done. So these kind of ones with a instant finality uh, is really nice. Um, so yeah, I, I would say, we, you know, we need maybe like another year or two before a lot of the uh, alternatives kind of reach the maturity where they can really be considered uh, yeah, I, I, I uh, can't imagine how many smart contract platforms there will be in two years uh, that that have come out by that time. The, I guess the last kind of abstract question or, or weird question that you could put it, uh, you studied psychology at the University of Sydney. And I'm, I wonder like how your studies kind of how they make you look at this play to earn model where traditionally a user kind of has like paid or gone past a subscription wall or something to like play this certain game to now users getting incentivized more and more to take part in different platforms. What goes on from like a psychology perspective and, and where do you see like this pay or, or play to earn model going just in your mind? Uh, I'm interested to hear what you think about kind of this, this shift from that, from one model to the other and, and where that goes uh, in the future. I know that's super abstract. Take your time. <laughs> yeah. I mean, uh, I certainly wouldn't consider myself, you know, I, I found psychology interesting. That's why I uh, studied it. But as soon as it got too deep, I'm like, uh, you know, a, a lot of the uh, courses are like, if you're, you do, you do like the first level of all the super interesting psycho, you know, the experiments and the kind of broad sense of the field. And then they start to like train you to be a psychologist and, and do three hour uh. experiments. It's like, you know, I'm out of here. But like, I think certainly, you know, crypto generally, that's one of the the most appealing kind of pieces of the field is like, it's not just like technology, there's like this heavy like game theory of designing a system and the, the correct incentives, um, which is very different, uh, or at least it's, it's a lot more explicit, uh, you know, it's like kind of planning a mini economy um, compared to like a traditional, startup as far as like the the shift from pay to play to kind of play to earn yeah i mean i think it, it's really uh there's a limited you know, number of people that can pay and so uh i think this uh expanding kind of the kind of accessibility uh and uh kind of yeah i mean like I guess I think one of the biggest pieces is like this alignment between, uh, you know, apps and their users essentially. So in like a pay to play model, it's kind of like, okay, how can, how can we extract as, as much out of our um, uh, users as possible? And maybe one of the kind of most interesting shifts with kind of this earning and especially kind of with, with tokens that are, are network tokens you're kind of aligning yourself. You're giving the user something that is, uh, you know, part of this network. And then you're basically leveraging them to try and get the next person in because they potentially stand to, to benefit. So I think that's one of the most interesting pieces for us. So how can we, you know, leverage users, you know, I touched on it really early in terms of the comparison of how, you know, stock options have been so successful at incentivizing employees. How do we, you know, apply the same thing to users to to kind of basically? You, it's already happening. You you look at a platform like Instagram, while well, the the users are the ones that are kind of that are creating the content that gets the new uh, users in, and and I think it'll kind of go even further as long as you can get it right i think it's a it's a it's a tricky balance when you're giving people financial earnings rather than just kind of abstract social capital once they're getting financial capital it is uh you know a, a 
tight balance there, but I think it definitely will kind of unlock some kind of new behaviors and new opportunities. Yeah, got it. That before Mike goes, that was easily the hardest or like most abstract question I've ever asked on layer one. So I uh, appreciate you uh, doing the gauntlet there with that question. Mike, go ahead. Yeah, yeah, no worries. I know uh, we're coming up here at towards the end of the hour that we have you for. Uh, we have one final question, pretty much. We ask every guest. I think Q's got a long list at this point. Uh, but it, as far as a book recommendation goes, uh, what would be one book recommendation you would give the audience? And doesn't have to be crypto. Doesn't have to be, uh, you know, uh, streaming related. It can be any any topic, any genre. Yeah, I mean, it's probably it's probably already been given like many times, but uh, you know, I, I have to say, Sapiens. You know, it just uh, just in terms of like just like things clicking of like things you always knew, but just like hadn't thought about them that way. Um, I don't know if if you guys are fans as well, but like for me, it definitely kind of you know unlocked a few uh, kind of it was a. It was almost like a, you know, an aha moment to every few pages. So if anyone hasn't read it, I definitely recommend it. Amazing. Yeah, that's been recommended, uh, I think, at least once uh, in the past. So we definitely have to get that book uh, on the on the counter, if, if, if not already. Uh, this was a great episode, uh, Peter. This was awesome. Uh, I think we need to drop a few links, uh, tell the viewers and listeners, you know, where to find more about you as well as props and, and you now. Yeah, I mean, uh, I think propsproject.com from there, you can fan out to uh, you know, our Telegram, Twitter, all of these things, um, you know, a bit more detail on, on how it goes. And, and yeah, I'll, I'll send you guys links that you can uh, drop in the, in the description. Awesome, man. Well, this has been a, a great episode. Like I said, uh, hopefully we'll, we'll hear more about props in you now and we'll be using some of the apps uh, that you guys support here in the future, man. This, this should be a, a great experiment. Cool. Catch you later. Hey guys, we hope you enjoyed today's episode. Make sure to check out Layer 1 on all the audio and video platforms listed in the description. Thanks for stopping by and we'll see you next week.